Hi, I'm Rachel Dillon, and together with my husband, Marcus Dillon, we lead Who's Really the Boss podcast, where we highlight the joys and challenges of running a business with your spouse or family. Our mission is to strengthen families and businesses by helping listeners avoid the mistakes we have made so they can lead and live happily ever after. Welcome back to Who's Really the Boss podcast. Hey, thanks for having me back. Personal life, business life overlaps. And so multiple times uh, there have been conversations within the recent like one to two weeks about clients or prospective clients asking about renting a building versus owning a building or having a goal of wanting to own in the future. So just wanted to talk through what are the benefits? What are the implications of renting versus owning? Who is better suited for a renting season or era or um, always to be a renter or lease a space? And then who is better suited to own their own space? Sure. Uh, We can go through and even use uh, our journey uh, with our business, kind of the things that we saw and what we stumbled through as far as our real estate endeavors. Um, so owning versus renting, if you will need a physical presence in the future, your office space, uh, you're going to have cash outlay, um, for either rent or a mortgage payment and everything that comes along with owning the property. So you just have to evaluate which one makes the most sense for that chapter of life, chapter of business life and growth patterns of the business, whether you're increasing in size and need a bigger footprint, or if you're able to stabilize, um, able to utilize things like work from home or work from anywhere kind of policies or hybrid policy, or even if you are uh, detracting in size, what, what options exist. So um, I've always been able to see what our most successful clients are doing, most successful friends, mentors, different pieces of financial advice that I've gotten along the way. And owning versus renting has always kind of been one of those pieces. If you're going to pay rent to somebody, you might as well pay it to yourself. We like it from an aspect um, because it does provide another asset that is built up alongside the business. And then whenever you do have a retirement, a succession event, a a transaction at the end of your career, you've built up another asset to monetize or provide some type of passive income on the other side of that transaction versus only having your practice. And a lot of our time as client CFOs is spent evaluating our clients' investment portfolio. Their business is a large investment or a large asset in their investment portfolio. And a lot of emphasis is placed on that business. What we try to do is take a step back and see what other assets that owner or family needs to have in their investment portfolio, real estate, retirement options, uh, all of that fun stuff. And, time and time again, owner-occupied real estate is is smart. So you gave a lot of uh, benefits just through that uh, explanation. And what would you say, are there any tax benefits that people can take from owning their own building, owner-occupied real estate? Sure. There's, um, there's different benefits. And even that, you have to look at the structure of how your, your family is set up. If you have a spouse who is involved in real estate and can pass certain tests, it makes it a whole lot easier to do that. So if you've got a family office situation, you've got an owner, doctor, owner, practitioner that runs the practice of some type, and then you've got a spouse who is an, like an assistant and not speaking down as an assistant, but just is a facilitator of different things, an implementer, whatever maybe they're the person that's actually running the the real estate assets. And if so, we can actually elect to treat them as a qualified real estate professional if they pass certain guidelines. By doing so, you can accelerate depreciation. You can actually go into a loss situation on the real estate that they're involved in. And that loss offsets other income sources like 
wages from the practice or the profit from the practice. So there are tax benefits if you pass the right tests and do it the right way. Yeah, and then depending on the type of business or the type of building that you buy or build, um, there are other opportunities as well from having not just your business as a tenant, but bringing on other businesses as tenants. Yeah, so that that really goes more of a financial benefit versus just a tax benefit. So, and that's what we lead with. We don't let the tax tail wag the dog. And so we want to make sure that whatever we're doing from a financial or investment perspective makes sense, generates cash flow, generates income, generates value or wealth on the other side of this. Um, if it doesn't, maybe rent is the better situation. But what we see most people doing, if, if we had to do it over again, even though we've been successful in this, Meet with your banker, know what the minimum amount could be for it to be considered owner-occupied real estate. That could be 51%. You you occupy 51% of the building, and that could be 60%, 70%, depending on the bank and the situation. Owner-occupied real estate is more beneficial than investor real estate because investor real estate is more speculative. It's got different terms in the agreement to buy the building. So if you're only ever going to occupy 20% of the shopping center and you go in, the bank is not going to give you the benefit of the doubt um, and preferential terms compared to what it would be if you rented 51% or 60% occupied um, in that situation. So having good relationship, good discussion with your banker to know that because with owner-occupied real estate, you usually see a lesser um, down payment requirement. You see better interest rate, better terms just overall. Compare that to an investor speculative real estate investment. The, the downside of it being owner-occupied, if there was one, is they are using the practice or the business as pretty much the guarantor of the building. So they may cross collateralize assets in certain situations. So if the the building investment doesn't go well, they could reach into the business, the core business to go get made whole on certain things. And it makes sense. You know, that's the main tenant of the building and that's why they're able to give you preferential terms on that building. So, um, but that's, that's kind of the big scheme of things on why you would want owner occupied. And we see it as a strategy where if you're looking at multi office locations, maybe you've got a a dream to open up satellite campuses or multi locations, depending on your business. If you had a strategy where you were going in planting real estate investments, occupying 60% of, uh, a shopping center, getting owner occupied preferential rate on that, and then leasing out the remaining portion, the 40% at market rates, that 40% probably pays your mortgage to where everything else the practice is able to do is cash flow. It's investment, it builds wealth. And so we like that, uh, obviously, because it's a nice uh, financial strategy. What are some uh, cautions for people who have this as like a goal or a dream that they want to own? What are some reasons to either not do it or even just some things to do to prepare to achieve that goal? You have to prioritize what's most important. So if you're a new business owner and you've acquired a business in a certain location, probably the most important thing is getting that business off the ground really, really well, kind of easing into ownership, making sure it's successful first off, because the business is always going to be your top priority over real estate. And just because you have the most money to make typically in that situation. So we usually see prioritizing it being a very big concern. Once you're in the business, you also have to look at the growth rate. And is this where you want the business to be long-term 10, 15 years from now? Maybe this isn't the area that you want to stay in long-term. Maybe you're in a transitional spot and things are changing around you and you just have a different vision in mind. So growth up or down could be a, could be a factor. Um, the other piece is 
how much do you want to be leveraged? Uh, usually most real estate investments have leverage or a loan involved. Some people don't want to operate in that scenario. Look, Dave Ramsey is one that, you know, obviously pays cash for a lot of things. So it just, that gives you the timeline of when maybe an ownership situation, how long that takes versus being able to accelerate. So from the business aspect, the growth, you have to look at when do things start to stabilize? When can you see yourself as a business operating long-term? If, if you've got a location and we went through this, when we bought the business in 2011, we inherited a rented office space. We signed the lease. I think it was for two years, right? Um, we were in that spot for two years. I believe it wasn't the most ideal situation. We would not have rented that office if it were, our decision from the very beginning, but it created consistency in the client base and worked well for that season. From probably six months in, probably six days in, I was already looking at where do we want to be in the next chapter of business ownership. So we started going through what was the most appropriate to buy or build existing, um, just go through the different scenarios we identified a new business development that was going in. We did all the homework to go build a building and the time frame that it did to where at the end of the build process, we were able to easily move into the new building, exit the lease without a renewal and go from there and kind of update clients and um, people that needed to know along the way that this was happening. What happened in that first building, we built an office space that we immediately outgrew and didn't provide for additional rental income or investment. So it was 100% owner occupied and just too small. Not in not in the beginning. So we did actually lease out um, individual offices because when we first moved into that office, I think there were four of us and maybe only two full-time. So two full-time and two part-time. And then quickly after, within one year, I we tripled, quadrupled in size um, and had two to three people sharing an office. But remember, we did build the upstairs um, for a tenant. Even that, the design plan of that uh, learned along the way, the staircase was in the back of the building. So anybody coming in for the tenant had to go through our entire business first to get to um, that tenant. But again, that was very short-lived for, for what you would think if you go through an entire build process, this wasn't something that was already ready. I mean, we spent months, you yeah. know, getting ready, doing the build, all the things that go along with that, and then outgrew it. Yeah, it, it's no different than building a house. Uh, as soon as you build a house and move in, there's things that you wish you would have changed or done differently. We always approach things from how do we make this asset provide income or offset expense? So even when we rented the building in our first location, we sublet office space to that tenant who moved with us to the new building because the former owner of our business was using two rooms just for file storage. And you have to look at the evolution of business overall too for, for you to have two rooms full of just file cabinets full of paper we went in, we scanned everything that was reasonable. We put things in storage that were after a certain point and made it make sense that we could then use this space or lease it out to others and make income uh, to offset our rent expense. So we carried that over into the new building as well to offset a mortgage payment or the additional expenses that came with a new build office. Yeah, and at that point it was, like less than two years that you were in business. So less than two years of having, you know, whatever the name of the business was at that time. How did you secure funding? Like what was attractive to lenders to lend you money to build a building that early in the business life? Uh, personal guarantee. So you have to do your homework. So before we did before we even bought the first block of clients that started DBA 11 years ago through the different name changes and evolutions, 
we did our homework. So we got really tight uh, debt wise. We paid off the the dumb debts, the car loans, the credit cards, all that was paid off. I think maybe even the student loans were paid off to where we really only had our primary home mortgage and maybe a vehicle loan. I, I, I think we went into our first business purchase being debt-free other than the mortgage. So we had positive net worth and we were building that. That time frame also in my mind at the last firm I was a part of as an employee, it didn't happen overnight. I knew that I had to save money for a down payment for the bank for working capital to have the business start off the right way. So that was part of the 2010, 2011 preparation to buy the business. Whenever we went into business, sure, we financed the original block, the original book of clients through a bank. And on the other side of that, the business did well from the beginning. Like it was already positive cash flow. It was able to pay the bank and ourselves. So the bank, given that short amount of time of results, viewed us as a good uh, a good loan, a, a good lending opportunity. So we still had to put a down payment down on the new building. Uh, we were only able to finance maybe 80 or 75% loan to value. So they, they value what the building is worth at completion times 80% or 75%, can't remember. And that's the maximum amount that you can borrow. So you've got to come to come to the table with 20 or 25% of the purchase price of the building to put down, just like you would buy a house. Yeah. And so as far as a bank is concerned, they ask for certain uh, financial information from a business owner before they're going to lend them to to build or buy a building. And so what are some things that make a uh, business more attractive for lending? Uh, that you're you're able to, that you have positive cash flow and, pos- and positive profit, like net profit. Um, business owners sometimes get in the habit of wanting to show losses, write everything off that they possibly can that's in the gray area or even past the gray area just to minimize tax. And that's great if you can support it, but that's not giving assurance to the banker you're asking money for, money from. So it was a balance. We did the right thing from the very beginning, kept things clean, paid ourselves reasonable payroll. So all of that supported movement in the right direction. And I would say as a business owner, focusing on that, if you have any type of investment or expansion in the future where a bank is going to be involved, where an investor is going to be involved, where a future buyer will be involved. Um, so that's where our team comes in and kind of helps business owners, um, holds them accountable, keeps them in line, make sure that we're looking at the bigger overall plan, whether that is owner occupied real estate or not. Yeah. So enough on the owning, let's move to renting. What are the benefits to a business of renting? Or maybe a better way to say it is when is it um, more advisable to rent instead of to start owning? Flexibility to a certain extent. So um, with rent, you're signing, let's say a five-year lease and you're guaranteeing that lease that you're going to fulfill it. I mean, but you have sub, you can sublease, you can do different things. Maybe you can upgrade the space as far as uh, you're growing and you need to move somewhere else within that commercial development or building. That is an option. Typically, if you go down in size or down altogether, you have to do a sublease. Or if you just have a really nice landlord, they're willing to let you negotiate out of what you've signed. But if there's a personal guarantee, which in a lot of small businesses there are, you're signing debt, essentially. It's no different than a loan. So if you're guaranteeing to a landlord, you're gonna be here for five years paying $5,000 a month, that's 60,000 times five, $300,000. It's no different than taking out a loan because you're on the hook for it. Um, And so those are the things to consider. So in my mind, when I signed that first lease as a new business owner in 2011, it was no different than a, than a loan in my mind. I, I still had to meet certain requirements and things like that. So why would I sign that piece of paper, which is pretty much a loan, it's a lease guarantee, and not be left with an asset at the end of the day? So I'd much rather be left with a building or moved equity in, in a building that I'm paying down 
uh, after five years or after two in that situation. So it worked for a season. Business owners need to think about that. And this, there are pros and cons to both sides. Um, typically it is with flexibility on changes or size of the, of the office moving forward. Yeah, and just talking through that as far as the size of the office or maybe the type of the office that you're renting, now there are so many options with WeWork spaces or um, I guess you call them like shared workspaces. Co-working. Where you, yeah, co-working spaces. And you go in and rent either by the hour, by the day. Um, different arrangements can be made. But with so many people working remotely or working hybrid, that's even, you know, could be a recommendation for people who are not wanting to spend the money on rent for a building potentially to sit yeah. empty most of the time. So I think this is a new evolution of uh, how things are done in the last five, 10 years. COVID also accelerated what all the space looks like and uh, that no area is, um, is untouched by that. Even though we're in Texas and the, the west side of Houston, very high growth rate, still have a lot of vacant commercial office space. The WeWork and the other co-working options are excellent for people that want an option. They can work from home. They want to go into a place, have access to a conference room, have access to shared facilities, and it's nice and it's taken care of. You just show up, plug and play. That's a great option. And I think those are something that not only we, but also other businesses look at in the future because they value flexibility. They value the control. So usually those situations are, it's, you can go to multiple locations wherever there is one of those branded facilities and you can drop in. So maybe you're spending some time in Denver, maybe you're in Houston, maybe you're in New York. All you have to do is find a WeWork and scan your card and go sit down pretty much. Yeah. And I know that we have talked about in the the far future, not the near future, uh, but having potentially that we wouldn't necessarily occupy real estate that we own and that instead of having to have a place for our whole team to come local to wherever we live to wherever that office building is located being able to have the flexibility to spend that budget traveling and meeting together in a much cooler place and I mean that in both senses like a place that maybe is more fun and also the temperature Um, but trying out like do we meet in Mexico do we meet in Colorado do we meet somewhere else instead of having to bring everyone to Katy Texas because we own that building and it does it doesn't it's we're already paying for it and it doesn't cost us extra to bring everybody to that spot we've done uh, very well at our current office which is about 12,000 square foot we were able to lease out 7,000 square foot to a very stable larger firm. Um, They use it daily. They go to the office daily. Our 5,000 square feet, we were able to recently build it out on the other side of COVID for more of a co-working hybrid space. We also have a sub lease or two in there where they come in daily, but DBA does not go into the office daily. And so that's kind of been the struggle. And what we've had to think through is, you know, the, the mortgage is paid through other people, but how do we best use the space that we have. And I think the beginning of this conversation about selling homes and envisioning the future and what do you really want to do? um, I think some of that kind of weaves into what does all the space look like in the future. So some of these conversations um, revolve around now, whenever I envision going to an office to work, I want it to feel really good. I want to have plenty of options to where I want to park it at mid morning or the morning, whenever I show up and I don't really want to leave again in my car until the end of the day, until I'm ready to go home. So I want options for coffee, lunch, drinks, other things. And you, you're, you labeled you're it. I'm laughing at you because yeah. you labeled it that you want a country club office. I do. I, yeah. <laughs> and you want a country club office. You just, you want your gym, you want your lunch, you want your office to all be in the same if you, place. If you go not. to my Google search, cl- country club co-working is what I typed <laughs> in. Nothing is available. So if someone wants to go start that in different markets, you can and take the name. Um, the closest thing I found, and we can go ahead and build out our life for the next 10 years. (laughs) And once we no longer have a child that needs to go to a certain school and be present, um, I think living near an airport is very important for travel, for going to see kids, for going to 
just have access to what the future looks like. So you want to live in proximity to an airport or have a spot close to an airport. You want, I want, um, you, I want things to be walkable from the home. These are my dreams. Yeah. So <laughs> You're it's claiming funny them how, as your own. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. it that you um, are now in agreement with some of these things. Definitely living within 30 minutes of the airport is high on my list yeah. walkable is also very high on my list so yeah. keep, keep going and maybe i share your same opinion so <laughs> and uh for those of you that are familiar with houston the woodlands is a you know kind of bubbling to the top if we were to stay in the houston area be very close to cynthia woods to be able to walk to concerts to be able to walk to market street and go shopping uh you know all the fun stuff i don't know if we can afford for you to yeah. live that close yeah. to shopping but um i, I think We've owned homes on acreage. We've had that as a part of our story for a while. Maybe now it's just evolving a little bit and you travel without leaving behind so much maintenance. Because the problem is when you come home, there's maintenance. There's yard to mow or make sure that it's been mowed, flower beds, all that fun stuff. And especially when you live in a house that was built for a young family, you just don't need some of those options. So looking at you know, something like the woodlands or wherever the girls land, uh, typically is probably what we're thinking through and life, um, life changes, but life, what is it? Um, lifetime fitness now has a co-working space built into their facilities. So you could go to the gym in the morning, shower and really nice, uh, country club, set up like they provide the towels they, that's, that's kind of how we uh there, there's decide if it's a nice gym or a correct not so nice there's gym. a coffee bar there's protein uh shake area there's lunch you can get your hair done you can get your massage on you can get your kids taken care of um so you go work out you go up to your office cube area for a bit uh, you meet people for lunch, it's all walkable. And then at the end of the day, you go home and, you know, define the end of the day. But it's, it's one of those where that country club co-working space is what not only I am seeking out, but so many other people, because we figured out you can do work from home. You can do deep work. So the pull to bring people back into the office can't be just around production, just around work. It's got to be something more than that enticing. So you can't just buy a cool coffee maker either or yeah. provide pizza in the conference room. It's got to be an experience from now on to get your team really rallied behind even coming to the office two days a week and what that looks like. So for me, options like that, nice options, clean options are what is enticing on the other side of this. And I want something that is very walkable. In Katy, we have La Santera. It's a great option. You can do Regis or anything like that right there in the middle of town. And that's enticing. And I think those are the options that we will continue to evaluate as we plan the rest of our lives. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's exciting. So it it's fun to talk about. It's fun to dream about now. Uh, it, that These conversations were not things that we had when we had younger kids and we were like running from activity to activity and, you know, work and trying to juggle all of the things. These are different because now our kids are either out of the house or mostly independent. And so it's fun to think about. What are some other opportunities for investing in real estate? Maybe the owner occupied real estate isn't right for the business owner right now, but they do want to have um, passive income from a real estate investment. What are some other opportunities that they could do that could still bring them benefit and provide an asset to them? Yeah, there's plenty uh, with real estate being the underlying asset. You can be a residential real estate investor and deal with uh, families and properties. We personally stay away from residential rental because it's only a one year lease. You've got churn or turnover in that building. You've got to go in and um, make it over after somebody knocks a hole in sheetrock and 
uh, people just don't treat things the way that you would as an owner. So you've always got the residential real estate. You can build a portfolio, kind of manage it if you want to do that. And some people choose to do that. It's fine. You can also do commercial real estate just for investment. So if you wanted to go buy a shopping center, obviously you wouldn't get the same preferred rates like as an owner occupied, but commercial real estate, the tenants don't move out as often as residential. That's why we like it better because you've got five, seven, 10, 15 year leases in those. And then also you have triple net um, leases where the operating expenses of the shopping center or of that building are pushed through to the tenants. And so they're paying the operating expenses. If something happens, usually it works out for the landlord. And that's why commercial real estate investment development, everything like that is such a wealth uh, creating event. The other piece is there are funds available, REITs, real estate investment trust, and different funds that invest in real estate that have the underlying investment be real estate, but you're just a partner in this partnership and you have no controlling interest, no say in how it's run, which sometimes that is better for some people. Um, But there's plenty of options in real estate. You can't Historically, you couldn't go wrong. Right now, I'd be very careful because the underlying interest rates are very high in real estate. So uh, it cuts into your profit margin pretty quick. So maybe right now, the other reason to rent is because you want to watch and see what real estate terms change to. I think the last time I checked, it's in the tens uh, or higher. Uh, So double digit interest rates on speculative investment properties and businesses. So that being said, if you view that those rates will come down in the future, maybe right now you stay steady and rent and then look for opportunities. Don't let the rate drive all the decision because you also may be able to buy something at a discount or buy something less than what it had been in the past. And there is a real estate bubble. People are seeing that it is kind of coming down price wise. Inflation is a very real thing, but overall we're seeing movement So don't let the rate drive the decision completely. Make it make sense from a whole host of reasons to buy or not. Yeah. Well, bringing it back full circle to um, our personal. Owning is excellent for our uh, permanent main location. My opinion of that, my wishes of that would be to rent places that we vacation so that I can... um, be catered to while we're there when we own those places i still need to make the grocery order or go buy groceries make the meals you know all of those things do the laundry i'd love to have a uh, service well <laughs> and that takes care of that uh we're, we're hotel people or resort people not airbnb people and i think that's the other real estate investment that a lot of people look at is airbnbs those got uh, very popular over covid and now we're starting to see the decline in people actually leasing those properties out and them being as as good of an investment as they were. And so we have rented Airbnbs in the past and your comment is just that. It's like, I have to do the laundry, I have to do the cleaning, like this is not a vacation. And so it's a vacation, but you you know what I mean. It's a different feel of a vacation because yeah. still I want to make sure that everyone else is comfortable around. And those are some of the things that need to be done. It's not a let's hit room service or, you know, call the front desk and ask for these things. I, yeah. I would be the front desk in those situations. So it's, it's different things for different people. And part of the reason why Airbnb has declined as far as occupancy in the in the most recent past is because the world is back open people are traveling again all over different destinations and they've got i think like you they've gotten tired of going on vacation and working Uh, (laughs) so they they would rather just put the the placard on the door and say change my sheets you know uh versus not so Well, this has been a fun conversation. I think it's uh, been very helpful to anyone who's considering changing whatever their status might be, either renting or owning, um, or just have that as a goal and a way to get prepared for their future. Yeah, um, we've navigated some of those chapters. um, And really, it's we are, we've learned from people that have gone before us, we've gone like our our best clients, uh, typically had owner occupied real estate still do. And when it makes sense, it makes sense and adds a lot of value to their overall net worth. 
And I know our team is really integral in current clients who are moving into that um, owning real estate, whatever it might be, helping the bank get the information that they need and really kind of taking that burden or headache off the business owner. They can really just go back and forth with our team and have everything right at their request. Correct. All right. See you on the next. All right. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Dillon, and together with my husband, Marcus Dillon, we lead Who's Really the Boss podcast, where we highlight the joys and challenges of running a business with your spouse or family. Our mission is to strengthen families and businesses by helping listeners avoid the mistakes we have made so they can lead and live happily ever after. Thanks for hanging with us to the end of another episode. Leave us a review with your thoughts, comments, and feedback on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. Join us again next week for another great conversation.